Hey guys, how you going? Good? All right. Um, thanks for the introduction. Hopefully this microphone is pointing in the right direction. Here we go. I'm, not sure, I'm, I'm too short for the lecterns of this size, so I'm going to stand off to the side a little bit if the camera is going to let me allow. Um, yeah, my name is Ross. I am your uh, token Australian 2.30 p.m. speaker. Uh, apparently there's three of us up on stage, which is pretty amazing at uh, WCUS um, 2023. Today I'm going to be talking to you about um, my journey implementing uh, single page applications um, and the challenges that we had and uh, how we overcame those challenges. Um, specifically, we were implementing them into a WordPress environment, so hopefully uh, this will be of value to you. Um, so I just wanted to get a feel of who was in the room. Uh, so who would be a, a complete beginner? Is there a beginner, like are you just a WordPress user? How many of those would there be just here today? All right, none, perfect. Uh, intermediates, who, who, would, who would identify as an intermediate? Okay, uh, who would be a hardcore developer in the WordPress? Okay, so the majority, all right. So who here knows what a single page application is? Okay, that's cool, brilliant. Who here is Australian? <laughs> nice, all right, clearly at home then. Um, all right, the first thing I just wanted to kind of make clear is that I am not first and foremost a WordPress developer. I am a software developer and kind of business analyst. That's probably the best way to describe. Um, my team doesn't work directly in WordPress, but we do work with our sister business, uh, House Digital, who does 100% WordPress. And we have a lot of crossover projects. Um, so, cool, moving along. Um, just got a, a few housekeeping things that I just wanted to uh, get through first. Uh, if you didn't notice, I'm Australian. We generally like to take the piss wherever we can. Taking the piss is definitely diff different to taking a piss. Um, it's uh, just a translation. It's uh, making light fun of uh, usually ourselves. And um, Mr. Mullenberg just put, tweeted, I think, a couple of weeks ago that he wanted more art at, at WordCamp. So I thought I'd, I'd answer that call and Instead of using stock images in my, in my slides, I've got uh, some AI-generated stuff. So this is apparently an Australian riding a kangaroo, um, which is, uh, yeah. There's a few more to come, but uh, that's just a taste. Um, second um, thing is, reminder, I'm Australian. So not only do we have a bit of an accent that you might have picked up on, but we pronounce some things differently. Um, so as a bit of a public service, I thought that we would um, just get a few things out of the way uh, ahead of time. Um, how do you guys pronounce this? We pronounce it cache. Okay, so it's, this is cache. So I'm gonna say this a few times most likely. Hopefully you don't get confused, sorry. How do you guys pronounce this? All right. Well, ooh, we've got a mixed result. Let's say that again. Ooh. Was that niche or niche? There's no T in there. We say it niche. So just, just a heads up. How about this one? Ooh. This is a mixed one. I wasn't expecting this. All right, so we say, we say data. How do you guys pronounce this? It's actually pronounced emu. You've got to add a Y in there, inexplicably. But we get to choose how we pronounce this, so. All right, let's get to the, the good stuff. Um, so I mentioned before that my team and I develop custom software applications, mostly for very niche purposes, where there's no existing off-the-shelf platform already available. So. Um, usually they have some very sort of, uh, I guess, requ requirements that are, that are with workflows that are very unique, that sort of thing. Um, and just, there's nothing that suits them. So we, we develop completely custom solutions. We use frameworks like Laravel and Vue.js to deliver that. Um, but um, the concept of SBAs isn't unique to these technologies. So single page applications you can develop in 
uh, React uh, and a number of other JavaScript frameworks as well. Um, but the examples and case studies that I'm gonna be using today uh, do mostly use that framework. I was gonna have this slide just say, um, I hate WordPress, but uh, I thought there might be like riots or something and they might kick me off stage and uh, I thought it was prudent that I change it, but the key thing that I just wanted to have everybody take away from this slide is that I think there's a lot of situations where people try and use WordPress and they probably should not. So um, who thinks that um, medical information should be stored inside WordPress, for example? Anybody? Uh, I was hoping to like shush somebody out of the room. Who thinks some like firearm information or that type of stuff, sensitive information should be stored there? Probably not, right? Um, yeah, so that's the main thing that I just wanted to, to sort of, sort of uh, communicate. So I guess the question here is, so, so why not WordPress? I mean, the, oh, there's the obvious one, right? So the obvious one is security. Um, if you're going to be storing sensitive information in there, unless you have the budget of NASA, unless you have the budget of the NSA, or, like, that you really shouldn't be storing this sort of stuff in, in, in the platform. Um, and uh, the next thing that I just wanted to go through is, is the performance. So who, who here loves the meta table? <laughs> who think, it, oh really, yeah? Okay, let's talk afterwards. The, the meta table, in my opinion, is absolutely terrible. I think it's one of the biggest limitations in, in, in WordPress and, and, and is holding the platform back. But, I mean, in WordPress, you can uh, do custom tables. You can even put those tables in different databases if you want. But uh, ultimately, uh, if you're working with large data sets, if you're working with stuff that's, uh, that you want to be secure, that sort of stuff, I, I still don't think that uh, storing things in custom post types and so forth is always the best sort of solution. And uh, then there's the flexibility side of things. So the WV querying sort of aspect of WordPress is, is very limiting. Um, and if you really want to be storing your data in, in, the, in the best possible way so it's normalized uh, and you've got discrete uh, data, um, then I, I'm not too sure that WordPress is the best solution on that front as, as well. So yeah, you can use CPTs, you can use taxonomies, you can even have relationships between them. There's fantastic plugins like pods and so forth that allow you to do that. But uh, uh, yeah, from a flexibility standpoint, particularly for a lot of our use cases, WordPress is not always the best way to store that type of information. So is everybody on the same page uh, with me about why we may not want to use WordPress for storing um, sort of th this type of information? Cool? So the question becomes, like, you might be sitting there going, oh, Ross, like, if you go into all this trouble making these sort of fancy back-end systems for people and custom software and, and so forth, why the hell aren't you just making them a, a, a custom website? And um, first of all, like, I'm a terrible web designer. But, uh, and I'm a terrible designer and just in, in general. But there's a lot more that goes into sort of coding a website than, than just doing the actual technical coding itself. So, and then I'm not an expert in that area. Um, but more importantly, I think we need to sort of consider these types of things. So there's an expectation that things are in WordPress, right? But what's the percentage now, 60 plus percent? What is it, 65 percent? of uh, CMS is a, a WordPress. Customers are, are generally, if, if they're coming to us, they're generally asking for, or coming to, to our WordPress agency, they'll be asking for a WordPress solution off the shelf. So there's definitely an expectation that if you're building something these days, that it will be on WordPress um, for the most part. Uh, the other aspect of it is that most of, most of the customers, at least, that we deal with still want to be able to control like the design and so forth of their website. And frankly, we were talking with some folks earlier, and everybody is moving towards this aspect of just designing directly within uh, WordPress from the beginning. So being able to use things like the new uh, sort of block builder, particularly with 6.3 just, just been released, um, 
be able to use page builders, having all that sort of flexibility. Um, we're not going to be able to build that sort of stuff for a customer in a, cus in a custom solution, so it just doesn't make sense to try and reinvent the wheel. And then there's the maintainability aspect of it. Uh, this is pretty broad, but at the end of the day, uh, the WordPress backend is becoming pretty ubiquitous. Uh, we were kind of having discussions over the last year or so that it's, it's almost a life skill these days. Like, you, you, it's an expectation for in some instances that people just know how to update content on, on a backend. So it just doesn't make sense for us to be creating tools uh, to be, uh, particularly if you're updating blog posts. If, you, if you're creating blog posts, they should be stored in WordPress. It's just the way it is. Would everybody agree? Cool. Brilliant. Here's some more artwork for you if you want. These are, apparently, these are platypuses. Uh, the AI is just as confused about what platypuses are and how they function as the rest of the world, I think. <laughs> but they're playing Jenga. There's a bit of roulette in there as well. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of background in what, what, what I do and how I do it and why I do it and that sort of stuff. Um, but let's talk about the actual case study uh, that I wanted to go through today. So this particular customer is a collective giving circle. Uh, they are a membership-based charitable organization that manages a grant pool each year. And the members themselves are actually the ones that get to vote about where their, mon their money goes and, and where their membership um, grants go at the end of the year, which is, which is pretty cool, right? Uh, but the challenge that they have is that they've just got so much admin overhead. So they need to manage uh, their members, and then we're using a third-party CRM for that. They need to manage all of their donations that are incoming, and they had a specific donations platform that they were using for that, for taking the donations on a regular basis. Then they had their email marketing platform. They had a zillion Microsoft Excel spreadsheets that were floating around. Uh, and then they also had their website, WordPress. Uh, and they were trying to connect it all together with Zapier, and uh, it was just creating way more work for them than it was actually saving, uh, frankly, to try and connect all this stuff together to, to fix up all the issues that they were in, or had as a result of Zapier not doing its thing correctly. Um, so yeah, I mean, the challenge that it has, they wanted to drastically re reduce the number of uh, volunteer hours that were getting expended on, on managing all of this stuff. And uh, they also wanted to give a good experience overall to their members and hopefully um, retain more members and, and, and grow their member base. Uh, and, and just in general, they wanted to give, a, I guess, an overall good experience, particularly on the, the website and any sort of digital communications that they were interacting with or digital assets they were interacting with, sorry. So, the name of the organization is 100 Women. Um, if you Google them, you'll probably get a US um, organization which is not related to them whatsoever. So if you are going to stalk them, make sure you put the word Australia on the end of it. Um, if anybody wants a website lead, you can uh, go and check out the US guys. They, they, uh, they, they need a, a website. Just saying. Hopefully that was as diplomatic as I could be. But um, yeah, as you can see, they, they came to us, they needed a solution for uh, making sure that whatever um, we built was going to integrate delightfully with their new WordPress website that was getting built. We accepted the challenge. Uh, is there any How I Met Your Mother fans here? Really? No one watches How I Met Your Mother? Good Lord. All right, nobody will get this reference then. Jesus. I'm so confused. <laughs> All right. So how could we have built this? I think I've skipped ahead, but how, how could we have built this? If we wanted to be comfortable, we could have used one option, uh, which was iframes, right? Who, who loves iframes? Perfect. All right, I think I got my message across, but terrible for responsiveness. Um, Questionable SEO, I guess. Design flexibility is just not great. You don't have access to the document object model inside it. Um, they're fantastic. 
Uh, second option we could have done is built additional API endpoints on our custom software. Then we could have had some sort of code base or plugin inside WordPress and communicated that way and then presented whatever interface we needed on the front end of the Hundred Women website. Uh, that doesn't sound like fun. We don't really want to be managing multiple code bases, I guess, unnecessarily. And uh, then we'd have to manage all the API endpoints as well. It would just be a, a nightmare, in, in my opinion. Um, and we had a long-term vision for where the, we were going with, with this customer and what they were going to need down the track. So if we were just building a single kind of contact form, then API would make sense, but that wasn't the case. We could have built the entire thing in WordPress, right? That was an option. I, talk, I sort of explained why that wasn't an option before. Um, we, we could have built everything, or well, some of these forms in gravity forms, but we just wouldn't be able to have the, the business logic, uh, I guess, and smarts in, in the system that we kind of needed or wanted. And that'll become a little bit more prevalent when we look through the things in the later slides. The other option is just, and this is very common with SaaS products, is that you just simply put it on another domain, right? So uh, the problem with that is that it's just a terrible user experience for, for, for most of the uh, people involved. So if you're sending somebody off site for, uh, and just to give you an example, some of these SPAs that we're building are for fairly minor things, like just simply taking a single donation. So who's, who, who likes being directed off a site so that they can put in their credit card details and make a donation and be redirected back onto a site? Who lo everybody love that? We, we didn't want to go down that route. So through, through an admin, and we use the SPAs. So just, I mean, it sounds like a lot of people did know what SPAs were, but I just wanted to quickly run, give a, a very top level sort of um, overview of how they function. Uh, so when you have a traditional client, a uh, traditional website rather, so the blue section over here is your traditional website. You type in your web address, browser, which is the client, goes off and gets uh, or requests, I guess, uh, that, that website. The server sends back the document, and then if you decide that you want to change page or you want to interact with it in some way, then it's essentially another request and then you get back an entire extra page that you then render to the, to the, to the browser. Does everybody kind of understand basic how browsers work? Yeah, well, hopefully that well, WordPress conference, everybody knows how that works. So SPAs are slightly different. Uh, the initial um, sort of page request is there, obviously, but any subsequent sort of requests are typically done in some form of JavaScript, and most of the time it's returned in some sort of JSON format, but not always. But the point here is that uh, you're able to navigate around the SPA without having to have page refreshes. Um, and this particular architecture is just, uh, has a lot of benefits, uh, but it's, the, the biggest one is that it's just uh, significantly faster if you have used an S SPA before. One of the disclaimers that I just wanted to point out is that SPAs are absolutely terrible for SEO. Uh, most crawlers won't be able to crawl them, uh, so don't go try, trying to put actual useful content into SPAs. Most of the time when we use, or all of the time when we're using SPAs, they are being used in situations uh, where it's simply don't care that it's not being indexed. Do not care that it's not being indexed. We, we go to the member portal to be indexed, that seems ridiculous. So from, from, from a uh, SEO perspective, it's kind of a non-issue. So I guess the point is here, don't go and create a blog uh, interface, I guess, that is built on an SBA architecture. Disclaimer two, and this is kind of something that was brought to my forefront yesterday, is that uh, SBAs can be pretty freaking terrible for accessibility. And most of the issue comes uh, as a result of of the fact that uh, if you can imagine that you, that you don't have vision and you're attempting to browse around an SPA and it is changing what is in the document object model, but you're not being brought to the place in the form that you would expect to be brought, 
uh, then it can be very, very confusing. So if you've clicked the next button to move on to the next page, for example, then uh, if you're not brought to the top of that page or you're not, you're not even told that you have been, changed a page, then that's incredibly confusing for a lot of people using screen readers and so forth. So just to shout out there, if you are gonna implement them, try and make them accessible. Uh, please make them accessible. Um, we did a bit of accessibility testing last night and surprisingly ours are better than I thought they were. So we're gonna be talking with some of the accessibility folks to hopefully this afternoon getting them tested out. So that'll be cool. All right, so I mean, this is basically how SBAs are implemented. It's super, super simple. Um, this is what we hand off to our WordPress uh, kind of division, I guess. So it, it, I'll run through what's here, it's not very much, but you have a, a container, which is just a div. Generally that container will have a unique identifier on it. And then the second part of it is just a, a single JavaScript file that um, will render all of the HTML and go and get all of the other required assets uh, and it'll render it inside that div container. So SBAs, uh, can be full screen, a lot of them are full screen. They are the actual thing that you're looking at in the browser. Uh, in 100% of the ones that we use them for, we, we actually embed them inside pages uh, because they're, ge they're generally not an application in and of themselves. They are just a, a particular, I guess, portal or a, a component, I guess, of the, the overall solution. Um, and you'll see that in a few slides. I think I've covered everything there. So let's have a look at some of the results. So this is a screenshot from the become a member. So this is, if somebody wants to become a member of 100 women, they would click on the big purple button that's at the top there, and this is what they would be shown. There's actually some text above this, but we removed it for the screenshot purposes. Uh, but the, the, I'm not sure where I put my pointer. I was expecting to be walking around, so I put my pointer down. But the area that is around that form there is actually the rest of the website. In this particular example, it's using Elementor. And the, the, that div that I showed in the previous slide is simply just put into that position. Um, this is a very basic two-page form. And you might be asking yourself, why the hell are you using SBAs to, to, to to build a two-page form, this doesn't make any sense. But there's, there's a lot of good reasons for it. In this particular instance, we're doing a lot of things like checking if this user might already be a member, for example. We don't want people signing up twice to be a member. Uh, it is uh, looking at uh, how they found out about 100 women, for example, and th that, that particular um, field is something that is managed uh, in, the, in our CRM. And there's a lot of business logic also, if we were to go further down, which we can't, there's a lot of business logic around the types of memberships that are available and how they get, um, sort of how they sign up for them and, and what the rules are around them and so forth. So we could do something like this in gravity forms, uh, but we couldn't quite get 100%. We would need to say have gravity forms go off and sort of pull from API endpoints to do all of the things that we're doing on this form during the sign up process. This one's even simpler, frankly. So 100 women, uh, as I said, they're, they're a collective giving pool. They, they uh, get membership fees and then they all vote on where that money's gonna go. But people need to ap actually apply for the gr those grants themselves in the first place. So this is kind of the first step of actually applying for that grant. And uh, we've, this is a custom system which manages all of their, their, their grants. It's just one component of the, the backend system that we've built for them. This is just the front end interface that, where they put in a single email address. It will uh, generate a, a unique token and then send them an email with a uh, unique link which they can use to either start their application or even continue an existing application. And obviously to achieve that, we would need to have integration with the back end. so that would be another API endpoint if we had to do that with Gravity Forms. So this is the actual application process itself. Uh, there's eight tabs here. There's a lot of stuff here that it's asking for. 
Uh, but once again, there's so much business logic in here uh, that what we could do it in gravity forms, and visually, it's possible to do it in gravity forms, but we just wouldn't be able to have the same types of smarts that, uh, that uh, we have. Or if we wanted to, we would have to do a lot of gravity forms kind of programming unnecessarily. This is a screenshot of inside their member portal, and it has all the things that you would expect inside a member portal, where you can change your details, you can change your membership level, all that sort of stuff. But the key thing to kind of have a look at here is that we have a navigation sort of portion at the top of the screen there that is outside of the SBA. And I was, I'm gonna get into a little bit more details um, very soon about how we kind of achieve that. Because, but it's an example of where you would want to you would want to show, I guess, a, a logout button if they're logged in. Uh, you, you don't want to show that logout button if they're not logged in. Uh, you don't really want to show the, the navigation if they're um, not logged in as well. Um, and if they happen to kind of log into the member portal and, and browse around the website, you need some sort of mechanism to allow them to get back inside their member portal um, as well, right? If they're still logged in as far as the browser is concerned. So. What were the challenges that we had? You can enjoy this artwork of uh, Kermit. I don't know if you guys have seen the meme of, of, the, of, of this. Like, why is my code working? One of the issues that we had was, just by virtue of how SPAs work, uh, most of the time, at least in Vue.js, they add this little hash to the end of the URL, which is a bit of a pain in the ass, to be honest. In our particular, in this use case, it wasn't an issue because it only appeared on the pages where the SBAs were present. It doesn't really matter if you go into the member portal page and, and there's a, a login there and there happens to be a hash on the URL. Uh, but we have had it, or we do have it in other implementations where we have forms, for example, that are on the home page and we've had to find workarounds for um, how to remove that hash. So that's something that's just done the Vue.js framework. It wasn't a huge issue, but it's just something to kind of keep in mind if you are planning ahead to, to use uh, this type of tech, I guess. The second thing that we had a problem with was caching. And it's in particular, it's not necessarily caching of the content or the delivery of um, what's coming via the SBA. It's more the delivery of that JavaScript file um, itself. So by default, WP Rocket and all the other caching plugins and even, say, Cloudflare will cache that JavaScript file, um, which is fine. But when we're doing fast iterative, um, I guess, changes to the, our backend systems and we're uh, having to um, deploy or sort of push, or, sorry, pull regularly, it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass having to sort of clear Cloudflare cache and clear um, internal uh, sort of site cache as well. So just keep that in mind, we actually have it not cached uh, just for ease of use. All right, the the main, you guys are not going to get this either because you're not how I met your mother fans. But I mean, we did have some major challenges though. Well, they're not major challenges, but the, 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 that's what it's the reason people are here today, I guess. So how do we make this sort of appear visually seamless? Um, that's that's kind of the key for the for the end users. And the, one of the big sort of keys to that is, is the CSS aspect of it. Um, we found the best sort of approach to this is to, with, in our SBAs, just simply not try and implement any CSS whatsoever. Let the website itself determine that. And in our particular case, uh, for the most part, 90% of the design that you saw there is actually being, uh, I guess, rendered from the CSS that's already defined within Elementor. Um, so the button designs come across, all the, the form fields come across in, in the, the same designs, a lot of the padding and so forth between fields looked, looked good. We did have to do some tweaking as you sometimes inevitably have to do, but for the most part, we just needed to make sure that we had sort of unique identifiers and classes on the relative uh, sort of components, I guess, and, and just made sure that it was structurally um, good um, from a HTML semantic perspective and then, uh, yeah, handle things in, in, in WordPress. Um, this is just an example of how it also shows on mobile. So once again, we're showing the member area button, sorry, the mic 
because I can't even read it on any of these screens. The My Account button is, is showing, obviously, when they're, with, when they're logged in. Logged Out button shows when they're logged in, and they've got a member login when they're not logged in. Pretty simple stuff, right? And we found the easiest way to manage this was in our actual SBA is to uh, store a very deliberate um, variable in the local storage, which essentially just create, uh, has a token. Uh, and when the token is present, it just means the user's logged in. And that means that we can just use basic JavaScript, uh, or jQuery in this case, to determine um, when they're logged in, and then just hide and show each of the elements when we need to. So it's pretty simple sort of stuff. One of the uh, biggest things that I see, so from a security perspective, one of the biggest benefits that we have is the Laravel framework itself. So we don't have to worry as much about things like SQL injection, other types of vulnerabilities, because the framework just takes care of it. But one of the biggest sort of security risks that I think is an issue in this type of implementation is just making sure that we have a best practice uh, cause policy. And for those who don't know what that is, it's just a policy that defines who is able to embed and use that application on their website. So we obviously don't want people just being able to grab uh, our code, just punch it into any website, and uh, that would be a, a recipe for disaster. You have all sorts of phishing problems going on. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the sky's the limit in terms of what you could do there. The thing is, in some situations, you may want that being able to be embedded. So there's a lot of companies that just use this, this type of technology. So HubSpot, for example, they have, as part of their standard form sort of setup, is an SPA. It runs a piece of JavaScript, it produces a form, and you're able to embed it on, on your website. So in their situation, it makes sense. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time here. But um, the question we asked it like, did, did, did this implementation work? And um, I would say that it, that it did. We were able to deliver a solution that uh, works seamlessly with um, the 100 Women website. And we'll be continuing to sort of use these in future. Uh, and just some examples of how we're starting to use those. Uh, we've implemented a number of sort of back-end portals for our customers now using this technology um, because we think it's the sort of the ideal technology to, to use to, to implement those. Um, even sort of basic um, contact forms, as I said, do make sense in some instances to, to use them. Um, if you're doing uh, lead capture and you ha are having that come into a custom developed back-end system, then once again, we can implement all of that great business logic whilst they're filling out the form and provide the customer with the best possible experience. Um, and then it, we're also in the process of further fleshing out capabilities of the grant management systems for um, a couple of clients now, so, which is pretty fantastic. So that reaches the end of my talk today. I've got some socials. There's not too much there. But if you want to connect with me, um, Go ahead. That wraps up today's presentation. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Is there any questions? Sure. Uh, yes, yeah, so you are correct. So we're implementing this, this code uh, in, in all of those places. So in the, in the donations page, in the membership sign-up page, 
Uh, and there's, there's probably um, about, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, uh, my head, but there's about 10 different sort of SPAs that we have implemented so far um, on this site. Uh, but yeah, they, the website itself is built 100% built in WordPress, uh, except for these SPAs um, that appear in, in various locations. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the Laravel side of things doesn't communicate back to WordPress at all. It doesn't really have a need to um, because most of the important information is stored within um, the back-end system that we have, custom software solution that we have uh, developed. Does that kind of answer the question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so the question mainly is just why don't we build the entire thing in Laravel? Is that... Oh, um, mainly because our team is just more familiar with, with Laravel. That's, that's, that's the main answer there. Um, and, and, and frankly, at least in the, uh, the non-Microsoft realm, um, Laravel kind of has, in terms of... Um, PHP frameworks is by far got the largest market share. So we, we, we just, we, there's, there's a clear winner in that space and we prefer to stick with it, that's all. <laughs> yeah, cool. Any other questions, guys? Cool, okay. Uh, our workflow is not ideal, I'll be honest with you, but <laughs> that's often always the case, right? Um, but in, in this particular case, we actually set up uh, the staging URLs, which were, uh, to be honest with you, they were just on the live site. There wasn't really any sort of risk of them being on the live site because they're in obscure URLs and there's no data. Um, the database itself was a staging environment for our software application, but the uh, pages that they were on were on the live site, and then yeah, so we just fixed up all the styling on those on those pages essentially, and and then brought all of that styling across. So in private, in private yeah, of course there were private pages. Yes, correct. Any other questions, guys? Yes. What what was that? Sorry. Oh, t t taking the piss is, is, um, is very different to having a piss. So having a piss, for those who don't know, is urinating somewhere. And, t and taking the piss is just generally, um, I don't know, joking around. Like, um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's taking and then having. And then one, yeah, <laughs> so it's okay. The, it's, it, it's very clear. I don't understand why there's a communication barrier. Oh yeah, you can also have some piss. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah. It, it, it means you're drinking. Yeah. Is there any other um, questions related to the uh, presentation? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take other questions too. One at the back. Yeah, so the, the question was, like, will we be using any sort of member management system on, on WordPress? And the answer is no. Um, so, and that's one of the keys that, are, like, we could have gone down the route of using something like MemberPress or a myriad of other sort of solutions for managing members. Uh, but we just didn't want a million users in our um, WordPress backend. So, 
Yeah, we, we, we do, that's obviously one of the solutions that we looked at at the beginning, right? And we weighed up all the pros and cons of doing that. We could have taken something like MemberPress off the shelf and just highly customized it, built all the, the, the PHP for the, the business logic and, and tried to build the solution entirely inside of WordPress. Um, but in this particular instance, we just decided not to. So hopefully that answers the question, yeah? Cool. Yes? A hundred percent of them use Vue.js because they they have to for the for the single page application kind of technology, um, but the way that they render to the pages is entirely HTML. So when a single page application does eventually render the page after the page loads, uh, the document object model is updated entirely. So screen readers can can effectively read it fine. Um, no doubt you can do much more complicated SBAs than the examples that I've given today. Uh, and and uh, there, there's, um, I was grilled by the accessibility team yesterday uh, about how they didn't like single page applications. So I was sweating while I was going through that um, process. But um, it, it turns out that the way that we've implemented these, um, for the most part, is reasonably um, accessible. So yeah. Hopefully that kind of answers the, the question there. Cool. Any other questions, guys? How far? I, I don't have a time on me. Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Brilliant. Any other questions? Yes. If you could change one thing about WordPress to make it more friendly to SBAs, what would it be? More friendly to SBAs? Um, I don't know. The, the thing is, SBAs are kind of a technology that uh, you could implement into any um, platform, frankly. Um, I don't think there would need to be anything that we would need to change about WordPress itself. I'm just kind of thinking on the, on, on the fly here, because most of the challenges that we had were ones that related to kind of CSS and so forth. So as long as your CSS is, is, is good inside the WordPress platform. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess we, if we, so our development team is uh, sort of filling in grain with Bootstrap, which, is, um, yeah, so we started off kind of rendering all the Bootstrap classes to, the, to, to it initially, and it was just a dog's breakfast. So, yeah, we had to go through and remove all of that sort of stuff. Um, but that's not a fault of WordPress at all. But, yeah, I'm not sure if I can come up with any sort of changes. Uh, in, in general, I think if WordPress could some, somehow work out a way to move away from the, uh, the meta table, that would be fantastic. But um, apart from that, no. Thanks, Matt. Hopefully that answers the question. Any other queries? I thought I saw a hand, but then it was a microphone instead. Cool. All right. Well, that, I think that wraps this up, guys. Thank you very much.